He is the creator and sustainer of all the worlds, whether those worlds are known or unknown to mankind. Does not wisdom cry and understanding put forth her voice? Hello everybody, my name is Charlie, you may know me better as sci-fi fantasy writer C.E. Dorset, and I'm here to talk to you today about practice, living God in our actions and our lives. I'm going to do everything in my power not to turn this into a rant, and I apologize if I fail at doing that, because this is the one thing in American religion, and I can only speak for my own country, I don't know how it is in yours if you live in a different one, that is so misunderstood and so underrated that it harms the practitioner because they don't know that they're supposed to practice. One of the worst results of the Protestant Reformation is that it turned church into a passive spectacle. You see, prior to the Reformation, church was something you did. You showed up, you participated. It was the work of the people. Now, we can debate all day long whether how well people understood what they were doing because the masses were in Latin, but you participated. You were part of it. There was call and response. There was prayer. There were physical actions that you performed. You learned to say your rosary. You learned to say the Regina Cayley. You learned your prayers, and it wasn't something that you did once a week. And I'm not sure exactly when this changed, but I would almost, at least in our country, it seems to be around the Great Awakening, as it's often called in the United States, where religion and spirituality became a spectator sport. It's like going to a sports match. You show up, you sing some songs, then you listen to a guy talk for a while, And then you shake hands with everybody and you go home. And you didn't do anything. You didn't. You just sat there. You listened. You didn't do anything. Nothing was asked of you. You may have been encouraged to read your Bible, encouraged to pray daily, pray without ending or anything like that. But it wasn't expected of you. It wasn't something that you were taught to do. And I can say that because I grew up in a Protestant church and I didn't understand what was going on because we nothing was asked of us, any of us. We showed up on Sundays and we sat down, stood up every now and then to sing a song, Passed a couple plates around, some to collect money, some to give us broken crackers and grape juice. We listened to a guy talk for 30 minutes to an hour, and then we went home. And it was a spectator sport. In fact, when you at least when, I, when we talked about what happened at the service, and we talked about it like we were listening to an NPR show. How was the sermon? Was it funny? Was it interesting? Was it a little bit boring? Did it repeat too much? We didn't talk about what was actually talked about. And maybe this was just a flaw in the various churches that I grew up in. But when I talk to people, I hear that report over and over again that that's the experience that they had. When I converted to Catholicism... I entered a very different world, and I actually entered via the rosary. 
And so I was already saying my prayers regularly. I was regular. I was ready to perform the acts of true devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. I was practicing a faith and then joined a church that was an extension and concentration of that faith. And so, you know, I, I've, I've got, you know, I'm that wonderful old man who's got the story. You know, I used to walk four miles to church every Sunday. And, you know, rain, snow, whatever. I'd walk four miles to church every Sunday. I would not eat breakfast before I went because you're not supposed to eat before Mass. And I would get to church early and I would kneel in the church and I would say the chaplet of St. Michael. I would say a rosary. Then I would attend the Mass and feel the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. After the service, I would go next door to the convent and join Eucharistic adoration for quite some time. And then I would go down to the park. And that's where I would have my lunch that I had packed and carried with me downtown. Now, I'm not saying that everybody has to walk to church and all of that. But the, the reason I was willing to do that is because I understood the practice. I understood why I was there. I understood what I was doing. And that's what practice is when we talk about religion. When we talk about the service, the point of the service is not the people talking. It's not the singing of the songs. Those things may be important to you. But the real reason we come together even now that I'm no longer a member of the Roman Church, is for the Eucharist to experience and partake in the sacrament, to take in the real presence of Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. And to have that participation in his life, death, and resurrection. That's why we're there. That's the purpose. It is a participation on your part. You don't just sit and watch. You participate. You don't just eat the host. You discern in it the presence of the Lord. And this is the power of practice. My meditation is practice. Saying the rosary is practice. Lectio Divina is practice. In fact, you know that we at the Seraphic Church practice Minyan, which is a um, Jewish form of spirituality that was put together by Rabbi Rami Shapiro. And in that we say our ten vows, and there are ten practices that go along with it. And you do those practices. Those practices are the point because those practices are what get you the benefits. Th those practices are what makes it work. Without practice, there is no benefit. And so when I talk to people who have lost their, lost their faith or left the church and they talk about how empty it is, how boring it is, I understand. I thoroughly understand. Because most churches, and I would say even most Catholic churches, because I attended church in, many sta in several states before I left Rome. Some churches are really turned on. They're really active. They're really trying to live the faith. And others are doing that spectator thing. They're showing up. It's a little bit more active because you have to stand up, sit down, kneel, cross yourself, say the right thing at the right time. It's a little bit more active than what our Protestant brothers and sisters go through. But again, they just go through the motions. They're not trying to discern the presence of God. They're not trying to build that relationship with God. They're not trying to perfect themselves. They're not working for the reconciliation of the world. 
And I agree with a lot of the people I talk to when they say I didn't understand what the point of it was. Yeah, I agree. Because the point is the practice. The point is that we are here to, for the reconciliation of the world. We're not here to listen to what other people say and to blindly obey them or anything like that. In 1 Thessalonians 5.21, the Apostle Paul says, Test all things and hold firmly to that which is good. Test all things. When anyone, when I say something to you, when another spiritual teacher says something to you, when a member of your community says something to you, when a scientist says something to you, and anybody, anybody, you test it. Is it true? Is it true? If I tell you that you will have more peace in your life if you meditate, that this is the easiest and quickest and clearest way to enter into the kingdom of God, into the presence of the Lord, and when you sit there resting in the presence of the Lord, you will feel his grace pouring on you, you will feel it like you're swimming in his peace. And you don't believe me? Try it. See what happens. Mm -hmm. Test all things and hold to that which is good. Test all things and hold to that which is true. And not just hold to, but firmly hold. Hold firmly onto that which is good, onto that which is true. And this is the message that gets missed when people speak from the scriptures. Because they like to point to the scriptures that say obey. But they don't read what follows. <laughs> because we're not to blindly obey. We're not to blindly close our eyes and just submit to what comes our way we are to question we are to look for solutions we are to look for answers we are to practice father abraham questioned god on several occasions as did many of the prophets that was not wicked that was not sin that is proper spiritual practice that's what it is that we are supposed to be doing. Test all things. Test all things. In Philippians 2, 12 through 16, Paul says, So then, my beloved, even as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work, for his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and disputes, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you are seen as lights in the world holding up the word of life that I may have something to boast in the day Christ in the day of Christ that I didn't run in vain nor labor in vain. So he says, yeah, when I was with you, you guys listened to me. You did what I told you to do and you're still doing it. That's nice. But work out your own salvation with fear and trembling you have to do the work listening to paul was not enough just blindly accepting what paul said was not enough we have to in all of that we do seek out the truth and do it in the spirit of unity that god once for us. It's very important here because he tells us how to do it. So how do we do it? Do all things without murmurings and disputes. All things. How often do you murmur? I have a problem with this. I am one of the people that would have gotten bitten by a snake in the desert. I try not to be and I'm getting better at not being. 
But I am one of those people that probably would have gotten bit by a snake in the desert because it is very easy and natural for me to start grumbling. Oh, things aren't just... Do all things, all things, without murmurings. Without murmuring. Okay. So stop grumbling. Just do it. Just do it. And the thing that I learned when I did this, and when I do this, is that things go better. When I start murmuring, I make my experience worse. Whatever I'm murmuring about. It could be something I have to do for work, something I have to do for family, something that I have to do for myself. You know, anytime you put that phrase have to, it makes things harder, doesn't it? And this is why this is on one of my lists of thou shalt not say. I do. I have a list of thou shalt not says and have to, should, would, have to, have to, big one, have to. Not on the list. I can't say that. It's right there. Thou shalt not say have to. And this is one of my personal commandments that I look at as Lashon Hara. I look at that as evil tongue. Anytime I say have to, oh, I have to do this. Ah, Lashon Hara, I have spoken with the evil tongue. No, 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 no. Because those words are bondage. Those words hold us captive. So maybe I want to do something. And that's usually the case. I want to do the something. Like I have a story that I want to share. And oh, I have to post it to the... No, I don't have to post it. I want to post it because if I don't post it, nobody will read it. By saying have to, I'm letting myself murmur. And I'm not going to get where I need to go. I am handicapping myself for no good reason okay so without murmuring and without disputes oh disputes without disputes that's that's the real hard one right now that doesn't mean you don't disagree but disputes are a little bit more you could disagree but you disagree amicably and that's where it gets really hard don't grumble and don't complain might be another way to say this. Don't grumble and don't complain. Oh, here I am. I'm grumbling already because I have to not grumble. Mm -hmm. I said I have to. Oh, yeah. Do you see how that affects you? Start paying attention to these words. Practice is the subtle things. It's how you do everything in your life. It's not just your prayer. It's not just your meditation. It's not just your Lectio Divina or your Musar or any of the other practices that you engage in. Practice is everything that you do. You are a living temple of God. Every action that you take is prayer. And so you need to realize when you're doing anything, you are practicing your spiritual craft. You are practicing making yourself better. And that's not a burden. That's a blessing. You have the ability to improve yourself. Why wouldn't any of us want to take advantage of that? I want to be better. I want my life to be better. I want my life to be more fulfilling. Christ said, I come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. I want that. And I'm not going to be rooked into believing that all I have to do is say a couple of magic words and show up in a magic place and sit in that place for a magic amount of time and everything's going to magically be better. Or if I'm usually how they pitch it is if you send in a magic check to a magic post office box, then magically everything gets better. No, it's practice. Take on my yoke, Jesus says. Take on my yoke. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You cast your cares upon Jesus. You learn to act mindfully. You learn to act with kavana, intention. Intention and attention. 
Kavana and mindfulness. Intention and, in and attention. Those are the keys to proper practice in everything that you do. Whatever it is, unlocking the door to your car is spiritual practice. It is. Don't believe me? Start, start looking at it like that. Because when you start casting everything that you do as part of your spiritual practice, and not just the time that you take in holy meditation where the incense is burning and the candles are lit and all the lighting is properly set for mood and maybe you put the music on in the background and you're ready to just drift away into this holier-than-thou world of glory, glory, glory. Uh, grocery shopping. Grocery shopping is spiritual practice. Oh, that changes things, doesn't it? And it's spiritual practice on so many levels. Are you buying ethically? Are you supporting local food? Are you buying good food? You're just buying junk food? I know if you've ever seen a picture of me, you might think that I'm the last person that should be able to talk about that. But that's a struggle that we all have. And thus, it becomes spiritual practice. Cooking dinner, eating dinner, spiritual practice. Talking with your friends, spiritual practice. Are you tearing people down or are you building people up? Are you actively reconciling the world by making it a better place and relieving suffering? Doing unto others as you would have them do unto you? Or are you being self-serving and hurting others? I learned for myself a long time ago that despite my best intentions, that's the person that I was. And I didn't like what I saw. And I've been working ever since to change. And I'll be honest, I've lost some friends over it. Because they liked snarky, nasty, vicious me. And I don't want to be that person. And I strive every day not to be that person. All I ask is that you join me on the path. We're going to be talking more about practices that can be picked up. But I really wanted to take today to really drill down into what practice is and how important it is. I hope this helped you. If it did help us, spread the word. Tell other people about what we're doing. Share us on your favorite social media site. You really want to help? Like, directly help? Tweet me. Tell me that this has helped you. <laughs> I'll be honest. It's hard to do these sometimes. And the encouragement is greatly appreciated. I don't want your money. I, I don't want your obedience or anything. I want to be helpful. If I'm being helpful, let me know. If I'm not being helpful, let me know. Because I need to change what I'm doing. Your feedback is what I want. Let me know so how I can help you better. You can find me at Wisdom Cries Out on Twitter. And if you go to our website at wisdom cry, wisdomscry.com, you can find links to our Facebook page and everything else that we do over there. God bless you and thank you for listening. Till next time. Bye.